understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. The resistance. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. It's a trap. All right, everybody. Oh, hell yeah. It's time again to get down to business. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. Uh, my guest is the author of The Locavore's Dilemma, and his name is Pierre de Rochy. Pierre, nice to meet you. How are you? Oh, I'm very good. Nice meeting you, too. Thank you for having, or thank you for coming on the show, for giving me the time to talk to you. And it's funny that my wife goes, what's a locavore? I'm like, I don't know, but I don't appreciate these uh, college professors making up new words that I don't understand. So I'll ask them when I get there. What is a locavore? What does that mean? What's the passion well, actually, behind the term? That, that, that's not a word that was made up by academics, as far as I can tell, <laughs> but by local food activists. And essentially, these are people who believe that we should try to uh, substitute um, food that is produced within a certain radius of where you live, so a certain distance, to food that comes from further away. So um, there was a book a few years ago written by another couple of Canadians, some French Canadians, as some of your listeners might be able to tell by the accent, who argued that we would try to live for a year on food that was grown within 100 miles of where they live. Uh, which, of course, is something like 161 kilometers, but that's another issue. Uh, they were Canadian, but they stuck two miles. And uh, they believe that doing this, uh, you will avoid uh, moving food over long distances. 95% of our transportation system is based on carbon fuel or petroleum-derived products. And so if you buy food locally, then you spew out less uh, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Makes and perfect Mother sense. Earth, Well, thank you for that. Yeah, we, we're saving the planet and um, all that good stuff. I'm, I'm all and for also, that. And also creating local jobs, of course, of because, course. you know, once your local farmer sells you something, well, he has money to go uh, get a haircut locally and then, you know, patronize a local uh, restaurant, which hopefully buys local food. And so you keep the money within the community. Buy his tractor from the local tractor salesman. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, buy his clubs, petroleum yeah. from the local petroleum producer. Exa- yeah, yes. local strip clubs. He'll patronize. It's, it's perfect. Hey, you know, it's all local. It's all good. Yes. So I'm blaming academics. I mean, I'm a millennial. That's what I do. If I don't understand yes. something or if, uh, if I feel a deficiency, I have to find someone to blame it on. So thank you for accepting that blame. No. And uh, On behalf of uh, several of my colleagues that are generously founded by your National Science Foundation, I thank you very much. Oh, sure, sure. Anything I can do to support causes I don't know anything about with my tax dollars, I will do that as long as they tell me it's for something else. Now, the thing about the locavores dilemma, and I want to dive more into why this should matter to people, is that when it comes to food, like I'm passionate about a lot of topics. We met via Alex Epstein, who wrote The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I'm a big fan of his work. And he asked at the end of the conversation during the post game, he's like, what are you, what else are you passionate about? Like, what else do you cover on your show? I said, pretty much everything. When it comes to food, I'm passionate about fast food and food that tastes delicious and is really awful for me and about destroying my body in a libertarian sense with just deliciousness that I put in my mouth. However, when it comes to what you've written about, and I think about, you know, especially there's a lot of pictures of healthy food on your book, no vegetables, thank goodness, all fruits. So it's it's good. But I blame the publisher for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, good on him. My main objective with food is to avoid anything vegan, paleo, or otherwise inedible. So that's kind of where the scope of my expertise ends. I need you to educate me beyond that as to what the mission is behind Locavor. I don't know if you uh, are a vegan, natural, raw food uh, purveyor of sorts, but those things to me are evil and they should be banned. Well, I agree. I mean, for one thing, look at the size of your brain. And if there's one thing that all evolutionary anthropologists agree upon, if I may use fancy words here, is that, there's no, way our, on, is that there's no way our ancestors could have developed the brain size that they have if they had been vegan. And actually, for that matter, if they had been raw foodists, it was really the fact that our ancestors uh, domesticated fire and began eating a lot of meat that actually allowed them to develop the brain size uh, that we have, because our brain is essentially a a big uh, ball of fat. And you need a lot of proteins uh, and you need a lot of calories to sustain it. I mean, your brain requires a tremendous amount of energy. And so it is now agreed upon, I believe, by most specialists on the issue that there's no way... Uh, vegan raw foodists uh, among our ancestors would have developed a brain the size we have. They needed to eat a lot of meat and they needed to cook their food because uh, cooking your food in a way is kind of pre-digesting it. 
uh, if, if I bore you, stop me. But no, you no, at go on. Because you're, I have a huge head already. I've been told that yes. it's like eight and three quarters. So I but believe everything you're saying. But compare your head to that of an ape, and uh, the big difference that you will see, apart from your brain size, you know, uh, an adult uh, chimpanzee is actually not so much smaller than an adult human being. But uh, the two main differences you see with his head is that his brain is about a third the size of ours, and his jaw is much bigger, and they've got big jaw bones. And why is that? And that's because they eat raw food and they need to masticate it a lot more than we do. They need to crush it a lot more than we do. And the fact that our ancestors began to cook our food in a way sort of pre-digested it, and the one theory goes that this allowed our uh, jaw bones and our jaw muscle to shrink in size, which in turn allowed our brain and our cranium to expand. So by cooking a lot of meat, our ancestors were able to reduce the size of our teeth, reduce the size of our jaw bones, reduce the size of our uh, facial uh, muscles and grow our brain instead. So you're right. I mean, all this to say that being a raw vegan is and is not only bad for you in terms of enjoying your food, but goes against eons of evolution. It's not progress. It's, well, you know, it's. I feel like Forrest Gump's drill sergeant right now. When I go, Gump, you are a GD genius. I did not realize you were going to help me understand that you found the missing link. They're always looking for the link between oh, apes yes. and humans. It's that they stopped eating vegan. I had no idea. Honestly, I didn't even suspect that. I could have guessed, but I, I had no, ah, that's crazy. You should get but a Nobel Prize. Thing, yeah, I don't want to bore you too much with that. But if you look at our digestive system, the only other ape that sort of has a digestive similar to ours is a species of baboons that eats a lot of insects. That's where they get their animal proteins. But if you look at the gorilla, which is a vegetarian, their digestive tract is very different than hours. So even our digestive tract tells us that we're really omnivores and we should eat meat. So again, being vegan is not just something that we're designed for uh, if you look at our digestive tract. Bore me. You're on the forefront of scientific slash common sense evolution. You're on the front lines. This is this is wonderful. Let's talk about the economics behind it. For me, it's interesting to know that people are always talking about go local, you know, support local business, support local food growers and farmers. However, the economy as a whole is very much becoming a global economy. It's lifting people out of poverty. It's expanding the, you know, the types of labor. And, and it's making our food a lot more affordable. And that's the wonderful thing about the, our globalized food supply chain. And that's, and that's what local food activists never ask themselves. I mean, you know, if things were so great when food was local, and let's face it, most of our ancestors were eating local food because from their own backyard, I, right? Yeah, from their own backyard because transportation historically was so bad. I mean, I don't know how many of your uh, listeners have ever had to move heavy stuff on a muddy road or on a dirt road in a bad season. I mean, there's a reason why historically none. We have we have white privilege in my audience. We've we've never lifted <laughs> anything. Actually. Well, you know, you might have people who work in the oil industry, and you know, sometimes you've got to get to a field where things are very muddy and moving heavy equipment. They're probably. Not I mean, white. these people might be able to relate to that. But the point is that historically, our ancestors were really fed even, you know, a radius of usually 50 miles at most. And that's in big cities like Paris or Florence or what have you. And uh, what happened over time is that, of course, as transportation improved, uh, especially the development of the railroad and the steamship that could go against, you know, ocean currents or wind patterns, uh, our ancestors were able to access food that was produced in better locations in terms of having, you know, the right type of soil, right type of weather, uh, but also to diversify their food intake. Because, you know, historically, I don't know what culture you're from, but French Canadians, because, you know, we live in a place where it's, that is basically frozen seven months a year. My ancestors uh, grew fat on the, you know, the meat and potato diet. But at some point, it's kind of good to diversify your food intake. And so what the globalized food supply chain is that it not only made food more abundant and more diversified, but also a lot cheaper. And this is what local food activists don't understand. There's a reason why things evolved the way they did. And if you think that backward is the new forward, well, guess what? We'll revert back to that kind of life our ancestors had. And uh, once they discover that, you know, it's not like the hobbits and the Lord of the Ring, but that rather it's kind of miserable and uh, eating potatoes year round might not be something that you want, well, then they might reconsider. But since they won't do that, I wrote a book to explain to them it why is, this was not It a great is very thing. interesting to hear you use the argument, and you use evolution as your argument against eating the raw food diet, especially because I think those people picture the cavemen like in a cave eating raw meat and then one of them sparking two, you know, triangles together and be like, oh, oh, fire and accidentally figuring out how to cook yeah, it. Exactly. But but that's the thing. Our ancestors ate whatever they could. And depending on where you were the world over, uh, they ate a lot of things that we would find disgusting uh, today, you know, insects or uh, 
plants that do not taste good or things that were, you know, borderline poisonous. Or, you know, in uh, imagine this in Ice Age Europe, you know, you have fires, the other animals don't have fire. What, uh, what advantage does it give you? Well, you find a frozen carcass on the tundra. Well, you can actually cook it and freeze it and unlike other animals actually eat it. And that's how our ancestors survived. But yeah. Uh, the, the point I was going to make earlier is that it's interesting to hear this localism argument when you know, there are things that I wish were local and were strictly local, like the growth of government. I know you're French Canadian, yes. so you guys have these deviant plans to take over the world. But here in America, uh, you asked about our culture. We're a transphobic, hateful, racist culture. I would prefer that we kept all that stuff local and we didn't allow the government to outsource it to D.C. That's just my opinion. But with food, they don't want to do that. They uh, they want to keep it local. Well, the, the funny thing is that, as you know, Michelle Obama, though, has uh, developed the backyard garden in the White House. I don't know if you've heard about oh, that. Oh, bless her. She has. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. Wonderful. Well, you know, it's, you know, if she does it, it's obviously good, right? But what's interesting is that she was not the first first lady to do that. You go back to the days of John Adams and they actually had the backyard garden at the White House. But that's because, again, moving fresh foods in those days was not uh, so convenient. But what's sad is that right now... Uh, wait, wait, did you say lot- Michelle Obama wasn't the first black woman first lady <laughs> to have a garden? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying, especially behind the White House, yeah. I'm actually incredibly (laughs) disappointed by this news, and it sounds like history and facts, so I'm just going to pretend that that didn't happen. That's my solution for truth. Fair enough. All right, move forward. Yeah, but what's happening right now is that, you know, um, uh, you might have family in the military in the U.S., but a lot of local food activists are pushing for things like, you know, forcing American soldiers to eat more local food or else uh, people in jail. I mean, maybe they deserve that. I don't know. But there is this pressure to force people, uh, to force governmental institutions, school boards to uh, to buy more local food. And the problem with that, of course, is that uh, Nobody would buy food from, you know, much further away if, you, if they didn't get a, a, a better deal in the first place. I mean, why would you buy food from further away if you could get the same quality and price locally? You don't. And the argument here, again, is that, well, if you keep money locally, well, you will obviously encourage uh, lo- uh, local job creation. But the basic economics here is obviously that if you spend more on your food, then you've got less money to spend on other things, including, I don't know, a sending contribution to your president's re-elect. Well, no, that's true. He's not coming back. But Clinton to, Family Foundation. Clinton yeah, family yeah. Or, you know, so to elect Hillary Clinton or whatever. So local food activists should think about that. If you spend more on your food, you've got less money to send to your favorite Democratic candidate. So at least that should get their attention. But somehow they don't think about that. Yeah, the new URL actually redirects. It's uh, support a Redskins cheerleader dot com and a minimum donation. I think is one hundred and fifty dollars. Something, okay. Whatever equals a Botox shot. I don't know if you saw the Bill Clinton standing with the Redskins cheerleader at the Kentucky Derby. No, I'm sorry. I haven't followed USU's lately. You, you uh, guys are catching up on Canada too much. This is depressing. Well, yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's ridiculous. But the thing about the Redskins, I figured that's the right choice for him because who more qualified when someone has red skin than to bring, tell him to put some ice on it? I mean, he's, he's basically yeah. a medical doctor. Oh, I totally agree. He knows a lot about human anatomy. No? <laughs> so uh, let's go back. You're making a very interesting case here. I think about when I go to the store, like let's say you go to Costco and my wife loves these funky striped cantaloupe that I know you can't buy anywhere near Phoenix, even though our mm-hmm. climate's good for them. You got to go down to Mexico to get those. The best mm-hmm. avocados are in California or in Mexico. Some of the funny stuff she buys comes from who knows where. And I think to myself, these are these jobs that Americans won't do. Do they not want to grow this exotic fruit in their backyard? Well, that's the thing. Um, If you look at what has been happening in agriculture worldwide these last few years, the kind of jobs that are moving out of advanced economies, as far as food production is concerned, are the jobs that require a lot of labor. And uh, it's kind of shocking, but, you know, a lot of young Americans, I mean, you're a millennial, right? You said somehow a lot of them would rather be working for Apple than being Apple pickers. I don't quite understand, but, you know, and you've got uh, industries where obviously uh, producing food requires a lot of labor. So you can import people or what is happening increasingly is that these jobs, uh, these types of, um, well, growing produce has been increasingly outsourced to other countries. But places like the United States are still very competitive in terms of growing uh, grain, let's say corn, wheat, whatever, things where a machine can replace human beings. So somehow, you know, you've got to ask yourself, well, is being an apple picker or a salad picker 
the type of jobs that you want to grow the American economy or shouldn't you rather do something else, compete in the agricultural segments in which you have an advantage and let people lose, frankly, the, uh, the best way to get them out of poverty is to actually produce food for uh, wealthier consumers do their thing. So yeah, so why not let people specialize in what they do best and let people like us French Canadians uh, send you maple syrup. I mean, I grew up in a countryside, my friends had a sugar shack, which in uh, Quebec means uh, a, sh- a maple uh, a bunch of maple trees to extract this up, boil it, and send you maple syrup. But yeah, but you're right. I mean, you should get avocados from California and maple syrup from Quebec. It is interesting. I think about, you know, historically, the the trade, the global trade market of a couple hundred years ago, some of the places they had to go to get exotic silk or to get anything in the color mm-hmm. purple. And you think about these people now who are ignorant of history saying, well, just eat locally as if I in Phoenix, Arizona, in the middle of the desert can get any of the stuff I want here. I mean, we actually have a pretty decent climate for growing things, but there's so much good in the world. Why would I ever do that? In fact, I think about I've watched an episode of Stossel lately. I don't know if you watch the show or not, but I was even on it at some point. Yes, you were. Oh, I man. was. man, that. Uh, my wife has this weird mus- mustache uh, fixation with John Stossel. Like, I had a previous girlfriend who was the same. She was so in love with Stossel. I was like, come on, honey. He's like 50 years old. That was a number of years ago. But yeah. <laughs> we just, connected, what, what, we in can the, compete against we just connected in the most unusual way and unpredictable way. So here's – let's dive into the Stossel thing. My wife – I don't know if you're married, Pierre, but if you've been yes, in, okay, if you've been in relationships, you know that uh, Adam Carolla jokes about the list, and the list is two or three people that if you met them, you could essentially break your marriage vows without yeah. any penalty. There was a guy, a Russian guy who played for the Utah Jazz that you know made this famous because on his birthday he got a freebie. So my wife and I joke about our list. What was his name? The tall guy for the jazz. You don't have NBA. We already talked about that. Yeah, no, I'm French Canadian. I'm sorry. I'm not raised on basketball. That's the, that's just, that's one thing we definitely don't have in common. Oh, ours. I think our league will implode soon enough. But hope, anyway, um, but the whole thing was on her list, John Stossel was in the top three. I'm like, there's no way a guy who's twice your age with a mustache should ever be on your uh, list. And it, she's, it's amazing, isn't it? But but he has more competition now. You know, think of it. 15, 20 years ago, he was pretty much alone doing his shtick. So now there are younger, good-looking people like you doing something similar. So who knows? That's true. There was more mustache competition back then, though, than there is now. Yes, He's got that, that mark that's point. true. All right. So anyway, and the Stossel show was about, were you on the natural food episode? Because that's the one I'm about to, to go off about. Well, I was on a food episode. I don't remember. If, well, tell, tell me. He was about natural foods and he he kind of followed around some of these people and the extraordinary amount of effort they go to to follow this diet. I mean, it's very, it's very kind of cultish, right? And that's why I joke about the whole vegan paleo thing. I mean, they spend, this one lady spent a couple hours of her day purchasing, traveling to the specialty stores to purchase the food, which of course that doesn't mm-hmm. help the, the environment. Additional time preparing it by the book, storing it, uh, replacing it. And of course she looked like Skeletor, but he went and met with the gentleman who runs this convention for natural foodies and Stossel called him out right there in the interview. The guys like did this trick where he could put his hands behind his back and twist his shoulders out of joint. And he's like, if I was healthy, could I do that? And John says, well, yeah, but you were the same age and you look like you're 20 years older than I am. I mean, that can't have anything to do with what you eat, right? And the guy's face was literally aghast, no pun. And I thought to myself, that's the litmus test, isn't it? If the guy looks like a walking bag of bones, at what point do we start to question all the science that he's throwing at Stossel about this? It was hilarious to me. And uh, you must encounter this all the time. Yeah, no, I I do teach a class about food policy and I have pictures of the most famous uh, raw food advocates in the United States. And you're right. They look like they're out of Auschwitz. And again, that's because... That's because cooking your food actually helps helps you digest it. You get actually often more nutritious out of cooked food than out of raw food. And that's because, you know, we've been cooking as a species. We've been cooking our food for a very long time, but yes. Yeah, you funny you mentioned Auschwitz because I had written down here, they look like the mascot for concentration camps. These people exactly. who run these funny diets. I read in the, other, in the news the other day about this um, – this new epidemic and it's the health food epidemic. And they talked about it being the next health food crisis is health food. And I felt really vindicated because my wife, I joked all the time we got married that I didn't like the taste of vegetables, but I said it so many times over. It was like a liberal lie. It's become a truth. Like we'll go to a restaurant and the, this, the uh, person will say, Hey, this is the special of the day. I'm like, ah, it sounds like it has vegetables and I will pass. And like, my wife doesn't think it's funny anymore because mm-hmm. I really don't eat that many vegetables. The point of all this is is that the health food epidemic, I always joke, nope, sounds unhealthy. Sounds like it sounds too unhealthy. Sounds like it tastes like garbage. I really enjoy eating things 
that taste good and they're so mm-hmm. cheap and they're so readily available and they take so little of my disposable income. How is this a bad thing? What is wrong with these people who want to shut that system down or put wheat and corn into their gas tank instead of using oil? I don't understand it. Well, there's such a thing called asceticism. You know, a lot of people need to feel that they're guilty of some original sin and they need to suffer to expiate that. And, you know, Michael, the novelist Michael Crichton used to describe, uh, before he passed away, used to describe environmentalism as the religion of choice for urban atheists. And I think that there's a lot of that, you know, self-flagellation and something we must be guilty of something against Mother Gaia. But the thing is that ultimately, you know, a molecule is a molecule is a molecule. Your body doesn't care where your food comes from. And honestly, it doesn't care all that much the form it comes from as long as you get, you know, enough vitamins, uh, protein, nutrients. And there's a reason why we like uh, fat and sugars. And that's because historically they were very scarce. So nowadays people will say, well, we have an obesity epidemic. Well, okay, fair enough, especially in the U.S. But for the first time in human history, poor people are fat. And, you yeah. know, I view that as a lesser problem than having poor people either starving or, you know, being basically having only their skin on their bones, which was historically what poor people look like. So, yeah, convenience, good taste and things should not make you feel guilty. I mean, everything in moderation and, uh, you know, exercise a bit and do your things. And, yes, you know, if everything was killing us anyway – why do we live so much longer and healthier lives than our ancestors? Which is a question I ask every time I meet one of those people. And I'm still waiting for a decent answer. What's, what still... are some of the uh, the highlights that you get back? Because I love those kind of questions. Oh, yeah, it's always questions medicine. Okay, well, but w- where did modern medicine come from? You know, again, two centuries ago, 80% of the people were uh, living on farms. Then today it's less than 1% in advanced economies. And we could not have developed modern medicine without getting smart people off the farm and uh, putting them into other lines of work where they could develop that kind of uh, those kinds of things. But this required economies of scale, this required specialization, this required long-distance transportation, this required developing agribusiness. There's no way we can produce the amount of food that we would produce today without uh, modern technologies. So, you know, the argument that, well, medicine did it, well, no. It was getting, pe- it was getting the smart people off the farm and giving them the opportunity to develop other skill sets that they had that got us where we are today. But one cannot go without the other. You cannot get the type of society that you have today and the type of human beings that we are, you know, much taller, much healthier, living much longer with uh, much less chronic diseases than our ancestors without uh, having food produced by only 1% of the population and getting smart people uh, to do other things. I talked to Alex about my crosswalk theory, and it's this thing where I'll go to a crosswalk and someone will deliberately walk slower in the crosswalk because they know yes. that they have that control over me. And I think that that kind of like trickles into so many different parts of life. With climate change, it's obvious. People think they're saving the planet. So if you're yeah. not on board with that, you deserve to die. And I get that. Like I actually have a small amount of respect for the non-thinking people that buy into that or get bought or mm-hmm. sucked into it. But with food, with something that with it affects you so – like climate change doesn't affect me in any way. Even if it did mm-hmm. exist, it just – doesn't and like, I mean and I mean you're in Phoenix so you know if you guys can survive in that climate why are we worried right like what are we doing here it's 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 <laughs> proof that the first world exists and works that I even live here in the first place exactly. my great grandfather moved to Yuma in the early 1900s and was a roofer and an AC guy oh when AC God, was no. invented that like must have, uh, talk about insanity know, and he would have never worried about where his food I was came say, from would you be afraid of hell after that <laughs> no no not at all. But in like the last thing on his mind, because this is a first world problem, is ever like where the watermelon he ate actually came, like how far away it originated, right? As long as he grew up in the Depression, like their biggest problem was finding it. And uh, so there was actually some benefit to it being less than 50 miles away. But um, the question I want to ask you regarding the chicken, this is a chicken and the egg question. You talked about poor people being fat today. I don't know how long ago specifically, but I do know in fairly recent times, it was very fashionable and even desirable for people to be fat. Like in Africa, they still fatten up the bride because like that's the best she's ever going to look. The fattest she'll ever be is on that wedding night. Which one came first, right? Which one caused, what's the cause and effect behind that? Like, was it just a case of bad timing? Because a hundred years ago, if we had this much food, would we still think fat was sexy? 
Because think about how many sexy people oh, no. we'd have walking no, around I, today. And look at the Rubens paintings or something. Yeah, cultures the world over didn't matter if you were talking if you're talking Renaissance Europe or as you say, uh, subsistence culture in Africa. I mean, food was scarce historically. It didn't taste good. It was not abundant. And whatever was growing with your local area, well, you know, the Irish diet, uh, which was, you know, potato for breakfast, potato for lunch, potato for dinner, and, you know, a little salt and some uh, buttermilk, maybe, that was left that's over. That's three square and, meals. And, that's that's a middle yeah, upper middle class yeah. family. <laughs> yeah. But but the thing is that, um, yeah, it's, 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 people have no sense of historical perspective. And I agree with you. I mean, uh, historically, the rounder, the better, the bigger buttocks, the biggest breast was always what uh, was suitable uh, or what was uh, most desired. But I don't know. I mean, uh, something happened in the last uh, two centuries in uh, the Western world and, of course, in the last few decades in some other parts of the world uh, where suddenly food became abundant. And it's it was paradoxically because there were more people around and more economic freedom. And that's, again, because people are not only mouths to feed, but also hands to work and uh, brains to think solution. And the more brains you add, uh, the more you were able to develop all sorts of technologies, some of which found their way uh, back into farming, which allowed us to produce the cornucopia of food that we have today, which would have been celebrated. I mean, I think, honestly, the... The idea of uh, heaven for most of our ancestors would have been walking into a Safeway or whatever grocery store chain you've got uh, in Phoenix uh, these days. I cannot imagine how our ancestors would have felt. Well, you know, you just go back to the uh, late 19th century, getting an orange for Christmas in many parts of the United States, you know, was the most one of the most enjoyable things you would experience that year. Why did we go from that to our uh, to our culture today where we need to feel guilty about stuff and where we cannot appreciate all the hard work that our ancestors put into giving us the life that we have today? I mean, I'm very grateful for all the hard work that my ancestors put into that, but local food activists seems to me to be so ungrateful to um, all the creative people that came before them that... Um, I don't know. I needed to call them out. And that's why I wrote the book on the topic. Yeah. You can't be, and this is today's liberalism, you can't be a card-carrying member unless you've purged gratitude from your heart. You can't do it. Because, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, and that's it's a sad thing. But uh, to get away from serious moments, uh, how do you feel about, so we were driving in California. I remember going to Hawaii. And anytime we pass a farmer's market, my wife loses her, her stuff. Right? She's like, oh my gosh, I got to turn around farmer. I'm like, farmer's market? We just passed 15 supermarkets like between here and there. What are you crazy? These people are the enemy. I don't really say that, but <laughs> No, but to be honest, as I'm well, talking it, it, to it, you, it, I'm it, like, it, what do we need farmers markets for? The Walmart Well, actually, <sighs> and you know, you see they're, they're the enemy, but the, if you Google farmers market and fraud, you will realize that the food that you buy at the, uh, the farmers market is often the same food that you would buy at the supermarket. It's just that people lie, you know. You've got a number of journalists who have actually gone to the farm where these things are supposed to come from. And, you know, there's such a thing in fundraising, which is you, you don't uh, ask money from a beggar. Well, you don't sue a fly-by-night operation at a farmer's market. And uh, a number of stories have come up recently where, you know, when you have a fad like that, and I was going to say rational people like your wife, okay, I'm sure you'll cut me at this point. But, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of people just go to wholesalers or go to Costco and whatever and will sell the food and pretend that it's organic and local. And if you find them out, well, big deal. What's going to happen? Who's going to sue a fly-by-night? operation so who knows maybe you should just dig up some of those stories and uh, educate your wife in that respect well no yeah and she's she's great i give her a hard time because this like we agree on most things the farmer's market is one how much pulp goes in orange juice is one there's like two or three other stupid things that we don't agree on but the farmer's market i've talked about this i'm like when you go to the store and you see that whole idiotic organic section where they've added an additional label an additional 40 percent to the price of the product minimum Yep. The farmer's market to me is the equivalent of the organic section, except that instead of paying the extra premium, they keep the retail and wholesale, they keep the wholesale discount. And I have to travel specifically to them to get the food, which always takes longer and is more inconvenient. So it all evens out, but we got to be honest about all the factors at play here. No, that's true. But then you've got to remember that farmer's market historically is how most people bought their food until the supermarkets came along. And just the act of going to a place that is open, in many cases now, 24 hours a day with yes. easy parking, yes. selling you the amount of food that you want at the discounted price is something, again, that is wonderful that we take for granted. But uh, 
you know, there were farmers market all over the place and supermarkets were developed for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, let's, let's go to the local uh, buggy shop next door. If we can find one and get our <laughs> wagon re- replaced. Cause why buy one at Home Depot? Oh wait. Exactly. It exist. Yeah. So I do have an important question I want to talk about. This is a topic that uh, doesn't get enough attention. I know guy, uh, sexy mustache men like Stoss will talk about it occasionally, yes. but mm-hmm. farm subsidies. And I, if you, if this is something you can speak to, yes. there's certain you know, we've talked about onions and price controls. And if Bill O'Reilly talks about speculators, and how awful they are only when the market moves one direction, mm-hmm. but farm subsidies, would farming and the industry and the free market improve if we got rid of all farm subsidies tomorrow? Thoughts? Well, obviously uh, what would happen is that uh, the food, food production would migrate uh, to the most uh, suitable locations in terms of, you know, physical <laughs> condition, soil climate, whatever, but also labor. Uh, what happens in the United States, just to illustrate how your stupid agricultural policies Please. sometimes benefit other countries, uh, sugar subsidies. So in the United States, you've got inefficient sugar producers. In the South, they grow sugar cane. In the North, they grow sugar beet. But historically, in the U.S., you've paid a lot more for sugar than um, a country like Canada, which pays something like 10 or 15 percent more than the world price. So what happened? Well, a number of candy manufacturers actually relocated to Canada because sugar being one of of their main input, uh, they could get it a lot cheaper in Canada and with free trade agreements, then we can send you guys candy. So thank you for your sugar subsidy. Uh, I don't drink soft drinks, but, you know, we put real sugar in our soft drink as opposed to corn syrup. Some people say it tastes better. So, you know, it's, a, it's another advantage that we have. Now, if you were to remove that, of course, the price of many things in the United States would go down and you would even repatriate some jobs from Canada. So this is, I mean, sugar is one of the most outrageous things. But on the other end, you know, uh, what happens with the government, the right hand often doesn't know or doesn't want to know what the left hand does. So for a number of uh, commodities, like, for example, corn, you've got government programs or minimum prices or subsidies or whatever that will drag the price up. And uh, I'm sorry, that will sort of... um, well, so, some subsidies will drag the price up, while others will drag the price down. And so in the U.S., for example, you've got an ethanol program. You were mentioning putting food in your car. Yeah, your engine doesn't like that. You reduce its uh, life expectancy and what have you. But you've got to buy votes in the Midwest when you've got the presidential primary, so we all understand where that comes from. But uh, – what I'm told by real specialists to uh, study uh, U.S. agricultural subsidies for a living, and God knows I'm a masochist, but I'm not, I'm not masochistic enough to do that for a living, is that a number of things do cancel each other out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, obviously uh, a lot of people who are hurting the world over because of agricultural subsidies. And what kills me with uh, the present generation of uh, local food or food activists in general is that they're all uh, they're all for preserving the small family farm in the U.S., but if that means hurting really poor family farms in other parts of the world, they couldn't give a damn. And yet, you know, liberals are supposed to care for the world, and they're supposed to have this great view of making the world a better place, but somehow that doesn't factor into their worldview, which, again, as a non-American, as a Canadian living in Toronto, I find kind of interesting. Can you give my audience kind of a perspective on the enormity of like let's say USDA subsidies. I and I can't speak to Canada. I'm not that familiar with it, but I know yeah. here that we waste so much money. And this is really my bugaboo with the food industry is how much of our money goes to these industries with no accountability, with no questioning. You get like the USDA scandals where they're giving away minority, you know, farmer suits to people who aren't white or aren't even alive or whatever. Mm-hmm. Just give us an idea of how much money goes down the USDA drain. Yeah, no, for this, I will refer you to, uh, I'll give you a name at the end. You can talk to, I don't know if you've had Jason Lusk on your show. He's a, He wrote a book called The Food Police. He's an agricultural economist at the University of Oklahoma, a friend of mine. He can give you the lowdown on the U.S. agricultural subsidies. You should talk to him. As a Canadian, to be honest, I don't follow the issue enough to uh, feel comfortable to uh, tell you about this. But I can tell you that there are hundreds of billions of dollars that are wasted in everything from water subsidies to artificially maintaining the price of commodities, artificially 
buy, while at the same time trying to help consumers by trying to uh, lower their prices in some other ways. And, you know, you've got some Rockefeller heirs who historically got some subsidies for not growing stuff on land that used to belong to them. So the U.S. pork barrel is so big and so complex that, honestly, you cannot expect a poor foreigner like me to wants to study that for a living. That's just that, that, that's just both too appalling and at the same time just too complex. So I leave that to very competent libertarian agricultural economists in your country, and there are a few of them that you should talk to. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the referral. I, I do want to ask you one last thing about food in general. I had Kevin O'Leary on my uh, business podcast recently. He's oh, Canadian. Okay. You might be familiar with the name. Oh, yeah. Well, he's, he's a big name in Canada. And you know what? The funny thing about Kevin, I don't know if you know this, but he got his undergraduate degree in environmental studies. Oh, absolutely. And, and his senior thesis was to save a local watershed here very close to where I live, which, of course, now he regrets and he admits that he was a young hippie who didn't know what he was doing. But not many people know about uh, Kevin's uh, shady past. So I just wanted, as a Canadian, I wanted to share that with yeah, you. Yeah, and to be able to recognize the enormity and, and uh, quantity of your mistakes as a young person, especially when it comes to the environment, it's that's a that's a brave that's bravery. I mean, I know cross dressing mm-hmm. is considered very brave these days, but I have to uh, no, no, tip but, my hat uh, to but, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Uh, Apostat, how would you say, rejecting your green religion is, yeah, it takes a lot more courage. Yeah, think, leaving yes. the, the Church of Environmental Scientology. Yes, uh, exactly. But he had this clip on YouTube. I didn't get a chance to ask him about it when we did our interview because it was strictly Shark Tank and business and like I can't go mm-hmm. in so many directions. But um, he had a clip and he was talking to this young 13-year-old girl who's in the GMO movement and she's well-spoken. She's a cute kid and mm-hmm. he's on the talk show and he's trying to be very kindly and politely paint an illustration of how she's being, you know, monopolized because of her age and her uh, mm-hmm. appealing nature to promote this movement that she really doesn't understand. And I... He got, you know, it's YouTube, right? So it's the mm-hmm. the non-thinking dead here scouring him in the comments section. Like for a guy who could just have decimated a child, I thought he actually did pretty well. But I did know that he had his degree in environmental studies. And I, and I feel like he made a very strong case for the basic building blocks of food modification, which is cheaper food, more people mm-hmm. eat, more people get vitamins, less people die. I mean, what's, what's more noble of a cause than that? What are your thoughts on all this... GMO Monsanto craziness that you hear these people spouting on a daily basis ad nauseum? Well, again, I mean, a molecule is a molecule is a molecule. There's nothing that we eat today that has not been profoundly modified. I mean, uh, historically, the first uh, potatoes uh, were toxic. I mean, uh, the ancestors of the Incas were able to develop non-toxic potatoes, which was a great thing. Almonds, too. uh, I mean, wild almonds are very dangerous for you. Uh, Corn. I mean, the ancestor of corn is about the size of my thumb and looks nothing like uh, an ear of corn today. There's nothing that Is that the one that Tom uh, Hanks ate in the movie Big? You know, he ate like corn on the cob? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. But, that. but that's the thing. There's nothing that we eat today that hasn't been genetically modified. It's just that we've developed better technologies to achieve similar results in much shorter periods of time. And, you know, it's nice to uh, care about nature in the abstract, but there's still over a billion people who are malnourished on this planet, another billion whose food security is, is, is iffy at best. I mean, they're always on the brink of being in trouble. And GMOs give you more food uh, with uh, less fertilizers, less pesticides, uh, less to grow them. They're more likely to resist droughts. I mean, you're, you're in Phoenix, I guess you're used to droughts, but look at California. Well, that's these California. Days. I mean, we, we, we got plenty of water. grow stuff that might actually do well under those conditions. We don't have environmentalists building like a wall around our uh, our town, so we're good. We got plenty <laughs> of water. I'm glad to hear that. But that's the thing. But it's just, you know, who wants to go back to the horse and buggy? I mean, whenever I see a, a young environmental activist and I look at them with, I don't know, their smartphones or whatever, uh, and I ask them, well, would you want to go back to a rotary dial phone? Uh, Why would I do that? Well, basically, you want to go back to 1900 or 1850 in terms of technologies. Why limit yourself to food? You know, why don't you use a bicycle as they used to build them in the late 19th century? Why don't you uh, give up on your synthetic fabric, you know, your flashy clothes? Why don't you go back to the way people used to? Oh, man, that's not cool. Well, yeah, but why is food different? 
and somehow it just doesn't register with them. But get them to think about if you want to be consistent and if you think that the backward is really the new forward, why well, limit yourself to food? They would never let you teach students in the USA. You realize that, right? These questions well, are pretty you know, hateful. I slipped by. I got tenure despite the, my Marxist <laughs> colleague's best effort to get rid of me. And uh, yeah, well, what can I say? I'm a poster boy for tenure. That's all. <laughs> you are. They, they've got themselves a big problem with tenure because when the wrong people get tenured, just like when yep. the wrong people grow up in the Michelle Obama natural food era, they don't forget those things. And it's going to come back to bite them. Yes. Well, Pierre, I certainly appreciate your time and for shedding a little bit of light on the craziness that is our uh, modern day food Nazis. I do want to know what's planned for the next six months or year, what you're doing to further the cause of uh, education to these young minds. Well, actually, I'm writing the history of past local food movements and why they all failed. And I'm trying to remind, remind local food activists that, you know, you had people like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini who were very keen on promoting local food. And if you look at their rhetoric, it's, it's actually strangely similar uh, to what you hear today. So there's a lot of history that is not very pleasant that uh, local food activists are completely unaware of. So I want to make sure that they'll be reminded of it. Well, I hope that the publishers actually decide that they'll allow your book to be in stores. I think Target's probably not going to work. I think they just, uh, I think I read on Twitter that they kicked Ann Coulter, they're boycotting Ann Coulter's book because it says adios on it. Are they? Yeah, it's, it's uh, xenophobia. But your foodophobic nature, I wish you luck with that. And I certainly appreciate you coming on. And I hope to do it again soon. And when the book comes out, anytime. You're listening to the absolute unadulterated truth, courtesy of the Oh Hail Yeah Show. Want more? Oh, Hail Yeah, you do. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the Young Cons podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. And make sure to check us out online at youngcons.com slash podcast. Or chat us up on Twitter at RealTJHale. But I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in.